Hello, everybody. Already RFM, that's me, Radio Free Mormon, back again for the General Conference post-mortem of the Sunday morning session of General Conference. It is April 2024, and the Sunday morning session just concluded a few seconds ago. I was not translated last night, so I am back here in the chair to once again review General Conference with you watching General Conference so you don't have to. Let's go through the talks. There were seven talks that were given today. I think there's going to be another seven in this afternoon session, but I am here to cover them all. First off, this is RFM episode 335, I believe, the choir sang Awake and Arise, and Henry B. Eyring was conducting. Now, he's not able, apparently, or able safely to make it to the lectern to stand up and walk over there. So he is conducting, but he's sitting down. You recall that yesterday he gave his talk, which was pre-recorded at another time. He is present in the general conference, uh, the convention center, the conference center. He's present. He's sitting down where he usually sits, but he has a little desk in front of him. And the desk is made in such a way as to sort of replicate the view of the, um, the pulpit where people stand and talk. He has a little version of it where he sits. And so the camera can come right up on him and he can conduct from there. He is still sitting in his high back, red crushed velvet wing chair. President Nelson, once again, missing in action. He is at home again, watching the conference from there. The choir now sings again, come ye children of the Lord. The invocation is given by elder something unpronounceable. And the first speaker is Ronald Rasband. Ronald Rasband is going to talk about words, and he's going to use a lot of words to talk about words. It's like the line from Hamlet, right? What do you read, my Lord? Words, words, words. He tells us words matter. Um, Ronald Rasband has an uncanny knack of building from the very bottom and going up. He's not going to take it for granted that we know anything about anything, really. He will tell us all the basic building blocks to get to his point. And its point is going to be, words matter. Words can harm people. Words can build people up. So let's use the words that build people up and not the words that harm people. Certainly a laudatory kind of message. Words matter. Um, it's the bedrock of how we connect. Sometimes we speak. Sometimes we listen. Words set a tone. They relate our experiences for good or bad. See what I mean about he's not going to leave any child behind with this kind of talk. He's going to make sure everybody knows what words do and what words are. Words can be thoughtless. <clears throat> he goes on, hasty and hateful. They can cut down and lead to destructive actions. Okay? Like, you know, that's interesting and mildly ironic. He's talking sort of theoretically about words being used that can cut people down and lead to destructive actions. And I think that it may be hard for him to see that the leaders of the church that he belongs to have on occasion and even frequently used words that cut people down and even lead to destructive actions. Yeah. Physician, heal thyself on this one, maybe. Words can also celebrate victory. They can be hopeful. They can be encouraging. Words can open our minds to truth. That is why the Lord's words matter most of all. And guess who has the monopoly on the Lord's words? Yeah, the Mormons. He quotes Alma about saying that the preaching of the word had had more powerful effect upon the people than the sword or anything else. We all know the scripture. Therefore, it was expedient to try the virtue of the word of God. Look, it's obvious that he went and he did a search of the scriptures for the word, word, and then he's going to show us his results. Lots of talks are like that. Elder Oaks is going to do a talk like that. At the end, except instead of searching for the scriptures with word in it, he's searching for scriptures with the word covenant in it. Yeah, we're going to get one of those talks. So God used words to bring the universe into existence. He goes into Genesis chapter And uh, once again, he's just going to talk about all these words. And he goes to new, the New Testament. Yeah, they used words there too. <laughs> and uh, he talks about Mary and the Magnificat. 
Behold the handmaid of the Lord, let it be unto me according to thy word. Yep, it's got word in there too. He quotes President Nelson. President Nelson, I counted, gets quoted every single talk here. If there were any talks in prior sessions that missed him, they were few and far between. Elder Nelson, I think, gets quoted more than anybody in general conference, including God. So Nelson's quoted, if you study his words, your ability to be more like him, and that's God. If you study God's words is what President Nelson had said, your ability to be more like him will increase. Well, it's a quote that has words in it. We hear Jesus in the words of scripture, but do we recognize he is speaking to us? Elder Rasband asks penetratingly. Here we go. We hear him in personal revelation and promptings of the Holy Ghost, but we only hear him if he's saying the same thing as the church leaders. That was my little comment. Elder Rasband says, we hear him in personal revelation and promptings of the Holy Ghost. And I said, but we actually only hear him. We're only hearing him if he's saying the same thing as the church leaders say. That's the rules of Mormonism. It gives you personal revelation with one hand and then it takes it away with the other by insisting that any personal revelation you get match up with what the leaders say. Again, we have the strange situation, and this is coming more and more to my mind as I listen to these talks. It's kind of a new thought that I've developed here watching this general conference. Again, we have the strange situation of God being bound by church leaders every bit as much as the members are bound by the church leaders. We can only hear the words of God to the extent that they match up with the words of the church leaders. So God then can communicate with us only to the extent that what he tells us matches what the leaders say. God is bound by the church leaders every bit as much as the members are. Next, he says, the words of the prophets matter. Well, we knew that. He witnessed, let me see, witness that Nelson speaks the words. He's a witness, I'm sorry. Some of these uh, notes that I'm typing down furiously as they're speaking aren't immediately translatable to me as I'm looking at them later. He is a witness. Elder Rasband is a witness that President Nelson speaks the words of the Lord. He says that President Nelson has a way with words and quotes phrases from him from covenant path all the way down to things celestial <clears throat> and many in between. He quotes President Nelson again at length on the think celestial bit from the last general conference. He seems to not be able to really quote President Nelson enough. But then he quotes Elder George Albert Smith to the effect that the obligation we make when we raise our hands to sustain the leaders is most sacred. It means we will stand behind him, pray for him, and strive to carry out his instructions. So once again, we sustain the leaders, which means we are going to do everything we can to carry out their instructions, which means do everything they tell us to do. In other words, we will diligently act upon our prophet's words. He gives us a personal experience. He likens it to Jacob saying, and this is the Jacob in the Book of Mormon, <clears throat> which he quotes saying, I heard the voice of the Lord speaking to me in very word. And he quotes that from the Book of Mormon, but then he indicates, Elder Rasband does, that he as well has heard the Lord speaking to Elder Rasband in very word. And I thought, really? Very word? Well, this will be interesting. He's going to tell a story where he hears the voice of the Lord speaking to him in very word. He was in Bangkok, Elder Rasband, to dedicate the temple there. He says it was six stories. It was had nine spires. And what came to his mind is that this country had been cradled in the arms of apostles and prophets. He prepared a dedicatory prayer months earlier for the dedication of the temple, which Elder Rasband was responsible for. And the night before the temple was to be dedicated, he wakes up in a cold sweat because he realizes something's wrong with the dedicatory prayer. Now, it's already been written out. It's already been published. It's already been translated into all these different languages. So this is a really bad time to come to this realization. 
but he realizes what it is because something's missing. Something's missing from this dedicatory prayer. And he tried to put the prompting away, but the Holy Ghost would not leave him alone. And what he realized then through the Holy Ghost talking to him is that he needs to include this one sentence in the dedicatory prayer. And this one sentence contains three quotes from President Nelson. May we think celestial, letting thy spirit prevail in our lives and strive to be peacemakers always. That was the line that came to him that needed to be included in the dedicatory prayer for the Bangkok temple. And these are the words of the Lord because they were spoken by President Nelson. The Lord was reminding him of the words of our living prophet. This third is our own words. The first words he's talking about, words of God, then the words of the prophet. Now he's going to talk about our own words. Once again, he talks about how our words can hurt others. This extends to the internet and to tweets. Be careful what you say and how you say it. Always good advice. There are three simple phrases, he tells us, that we can use to take the sting out of difficulties and differences. And here's the three simple phrases. Thank you, I am sorry, and I love you. <clears throat> he says use them frequently. By the way, I recognize this is kind of simplistic. I also recognize that you know, if we use these words more, things probably might go a little bit better. It might make things better. Absolutely. The I love you part <clears throat> seems to get used a little bit too much in the church. And I only say that because a lot of times uh, people that don't know us, they might be a leader in the church. They might never even have met us are up there talking about how they love us and how the prophet loves us. And I think, how can you love me if you don't know me? And if you claim to love me without knowing me, how valuable is that love really? It's not really personalized. It's more just something that you feel obligated to say. But I think that if you do love someone <clears throat> personally, yeah, you should tell them you love them. If you make a mistake, yeah, you should say you're sorry. And if someone does something nice for you, you should say thank you. So a little inane, but not bad advice on the whole. He gives a personal example. He says before he was called to be an apostle, he traveled widely for his company to the far reaches of the world. But at the end of each day, he always called home to talk to his wife. And when his wife, Melanie, picked up the phone and he reported in at the end of each day, the conversation always led to expressions of, I love you. Well. That's nice. I mean that. Those words were a protection to him against evil designs. Now, he says that these words that he uses, the thank you, um, the I love you, he says these words were a protection to him against evil designs. There are so many times in general conference where words are used to say one thing and then they're never explained. And it just stands there. It, it hangs out there. And I have no idea what he means. These words were a protection to him against evil designs. But at least now, apparently, the temple garment is getting an assist. Because I thought it was the temple garment that was supposed to protect us from evil designs. Now, these words can. If we feast, he says, on the words of Christ, our prophet's words and our own words, the powers of heaven will pour down upon us. There's the apostolic promise. And he says, Jesus Christ is the word. Okay, that's the end of that talk. <clears throat> Let's go on to President Susan H. Porter, who is the primary general president. She's going to talk to the children, and she sure talks like it. I mean, I don't mean to be rude here, but if you watch her, she has a constant contortion of her face, almost like it's folding in upon itself to maintain this saccharinely sweet smile where she's talking to the children in that tone of voice, the primary teacher tone of voice throughout. It's difficult for me to, to listen to. I can't imagine it's any easier for children to listen to. Maybe it is. I don't know. She says, <clears throat> do you like to receive gifts? And she's going to talk about a very special gift that God has given, the gift of prayer. So her talk is going to be on prayer. What gifts can you pray for? Her three gifts she's going to focus on are pray to know, pray to grow, and pray to show. 
seriously. <clears throat> so we pray to know, um, Heavenly Father, are you really there? And do you hear and answer every child's prayer? The words from the primary song. How can you know Heavenly Father is really there even when you can't see him? Which is a really good question. She's up to answering it, though. She says, pray and then listen to the thoughts that come into your hearts and minds. By the way, uh, at several points in this talk, she will ask that question, how do you know that Heavenly Father is there if you can't see him? But she will answer, he is there. She is the adult. She is the authority in the room talking to the children that the correct answer is, yes, God is there. And I'm telling you that he's there. So you can know that he's there because I say so. She says, the Heavenly Father has a body of flesh and bones and is the father of your spirits. You can come to know Heavenly Father is there and that he loves you. When you know that Heavenly Father is real and he loves you, you can live with courage and hope. Have you ever felt alone? She tells a story about one day when her granddaughter, whose name is Ashley, was six years old. She was the only one without a friend to play with on the school playground, and she felt sad inside. A specific thought came to her mind. Wait, I'm not alone. I have Christ. This is like Jimmy Stewart saying, wait, I'm not alone. I have Harvey. But she has Christ there with her. And the other thing that came to my mind is Christ on the playground is your friend is really not that helpful because it's hard to use the teeter-totter when Christ is the one sitting on the other side. It just doesn't work that way. But she closes her eyes to pray, Ashley does, and when she opens her eyes, a girl was there asking her if she wanted to play. That's a nice story. Sometimes you may want to know why something hard is happening in your life, but often the best question to ask Heavenly Father is not why, but what. Don't ask Heavenly Father why. He's not good on answering the why, but he'll tell you what to do. Remember Nephi and the broken bow incident, she brings up. Nephi didn't ask, why did God break my bow? He asked what, or actually, actually, she says he asked what, but then she reads a story, and he doesn't really ask what, he asks where. He ends up asking where to go to hunt. But it's close enough for government work. Just don't ask why to God. You can ask what, you can even ask where. No whys allowed. Second, she says, pray to grow. Do you want to grow in patience or in honesty? Grow in a skill? Grow in courage? Pray. He is there. And she says, my new friend Jonah wrote, and when she says that, I, I'm guessing there's a little kid named Jonah who wrote a letter. And maybe to her. My new friend Jonah wrote, I often feel nervous on my way to school in the morning. I worry about forgetting something or taking a test. I started taking prayers. I started probably praying on the way to school with my mom. Praying to Heavenly Father has helped me. By the time I get to my classroom, I feel peaceful. She says Jonah's faith is growing as he prays every day and then moves forward. Third, pray to show. Pray for help to show Heavenly Father's love to others. He can show you someone who is sad so you can cheer them up, etc. You can help others come to know and love Heavenly Father as you do. So every primary child, a missionary here. She walks about, she talks about, Praying for her father. Oh, this is a personal story. Her father apparently was not a member of the church and never joined the church, by the way. But her prayers worked anyway. Now, that's interesting. Okay. She wants him to join the church. He never joins the church, even though she prays for him to join the church ever since she's in primary and even though he lives to be 86 years old and he never joins the church. But this is a story of how her prayers were answered anyway. So she prays for her father to join the church. He doesn't join the church. She received her patriarchal blessing when she's a teenager. And in the patriarchal blessing, it says the best thing she could do to help her family would be to be a good example. Okay, so she's going to be a good example. And she is, I'm sure, for her father, who still doesn't join the church. She says her father lived to be 86. Here's how the prayer gets answered, okay, after he dies. Five days after he died, I received a sacred feeling of joy, she says. I felt he wanted to receive the blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is too bad, I think, because I was hoping that she was going to make it acceptable for her father to never join the church 
and still be an okay dude and still be a good father. But no, she has to receive a sacred feeling of joy five days after he dies that he wants now, now that he's dead and can't speak for himself. <laughs> now he wants to join the church and she's going to make that happen in the temple. So everything's good in the end. And her prayer was answered. See, every faithful prayer is answered. So God really does give us blessings. Sometimes not until after we die. Sometimes not until after somebody else dies. In this way, death and blessings are often intrinsically connected in Mormonism. She asked, what would happen if all the children in the world prayed every day? Why, the whole world would be blessed with more of God's love. Okay. She invites us to pray to know that Heavenly Father is there Pray to grow to become like him and pray to show his love to others. Remember, pray to know, pray to grow, and pray to show. Coming to a children's t-shirt shop near you. The choir sings a child's prayer. See, this is all interconnected. Third, Elder Dale G. Renland speaks. Yes, Dale Renland, he of the dilapidated dinghy. Now, he's going to do what he always does, okay? He's got a pattern. He's predictable. What he does is he tells this really rather elaborately intricate story. And he tells it elaborately intricately so that it can take up at least half the time of his talk. And then whatever the story is, he's going to use that to teach the list. The list of things that we're supposed to do as Mormons. From getting baptized, you know, repenting, having faith in Jesus Christ, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, praying, um, reading our scriptures. The whole nine yards. The story he's going to tell now is a personal story about a trip that he was on in Hawaii with his wife, Ruth, and their daughter. It has to do with kayaking. Let me just tell you the story. What happens is, is that they're going to take kayaking, and they're going to be going on a kayak to a couple of islands out there. They have a guide with them, but they also have these three kayaks, and he talks about how he was really pretty pumped about this because he had, as a young man, kayaked over in Sweden across these huge mountain lakes. So he feels he's up to it. He's going to hold his own. And they get out there and he says it's a different kind of kayak than the one that he used because he says the one he used is what I would think of as a kayak where you sit down inside of it. But he says these ones in Hawaii where you sit on top of them. So there's a higher, uh, higher place, a higher center of gravity. Well, what ends up happening is that he's out there and he paddles way out in front and he's feeling pretty good about himself. And then he says he got hit by a big wave and he shows the audience how big it was. It's like 13 centimeters, right? And it knocks him over. By the way, that's kind of funny when he does that. And it knocks him over. He gets in the water and then he has to struggle to right the canoe. Then he has to struggle to get up on top of the canoe again. And by the time he's done that, He's pretty exhausted. And not only that, Ruth and his daughter have caught up with him and they've gone on far ahead. So he starts paddling again and trying to catch up with them. And he gets up to them and then he gets hit by another huge wave, he says. And this one must have been like, you know, this tall knocks him over again. So he goes through the same process of having to right the canoe, get up on the canoe. He is absolutely exhausted and out of breath by this point. The guide comes along and the guide helps him out attaches a rope to his kayak and uses the guide's kayak to tow him along for a bit while he can catch his breath. He catches the breath. He goes on. They have a good day. Everything goes wonderfully. And he takes even longer than I took to recapitulate that story. But the main point he wants to make out of this is the forward momentum. And of course, he's going to spiritualize this. We all know that that's what he's going to do. But the forward momentum of the, of the kayak helps him not be knocked over by waves. It's when you slow down or even stop that you become much more susceptible to being knocked over. In the water, you've got to keep that forward momentum going. This is now the forward spiritual momentum that he's going to talk about for the rest of his talk. And indeed, that's what he does where he goes to the list. Um. So the spiritual momentum, we need to do all the steps along the Mormon way in order to keep up the spiritual momentum, including endure to the end, 
enduring to the end is repeatedly applying the other doctrines of Christ to keep up the spiritual momentum. He says we grow closer to Christ with each cycle of doing so. So basically, I, I think the momentum means continuing to do everything we're supposed to do as Mormons, going to church, going to the temple, reading the scriptures, everything. And as we do that, we keep up that spiritual momentum, and that will keep us heading toward Christ. Whereas if we slow down on that or stop altogether, then we can get knocked over by any kind of wave that might come along. He makes it clear um, he could row in the opposite direction and still have momentum, but it needs to be toward the Savior. Some people might think that went without saying, but apparently not. Once again, pray daily, study scriptures daily. Yeah, there's the list. And he says, just as we eat daily and don't wait to eat all our week's food on Sunday, we need to do all these things every day and not just on Sunday going to church. Elder Rinland, okay, I already said that, forward spiritual momentum takes us to the temple. And now we get to hear the same stuff again about going through the covenants to get greater spiritual power in the temple. Once again, this greater spiritual power is undefined and unsubst insubstantial. What is it? They keep saying it, but they never say what it is or describe any stories that would give us a before and after to give us an idea as to what it is they're talking about, about this greater spiritual temp uh, power we get in the temple. <clears throat> Making and keeping covenants creates a conduit for the power in our lives. It is becoming, oh, that's what he says. <clears throat> Making and keeping covenants creates this conduit for the power from the temple in our lives. And once again, it's hitting me. It's becoming clearer and clearer to me that Mormon theology, and especially Mormon temple theology, not only binds its members to the covenants in the temple, but it also binds God. Because apparently, God cannot give out this special power to anybody he wants he can only give the special temple covenant power to people who have gone through the temple and who keep those covenants. Once again, God being bound by Mormonism as much as the members. He says, don't judge. That's always a good idea. Don't judge, you lazy learner. <laughs> or you lax disciple. Of all the times that President Nelson was quoted so far in conference, that one hasn't come up. Yes, don't judge you lax disciple. Don't judge you lazy learner. We are all struggling in our own way. None of us can earn salvation. Once again, he quotes Jacob from the Book of Mormon. Says it is only in and through the grace of God that we are saved. We all need the atonement, not just part of it. Okay. But you know, <clears throat> it may be only in and through the grace of God that we are saved, as it says in Jacob but that grace has to be administered through the LDS church. That's the other side of the coin. So not just keep your forward momentum going, help others with their forward momentum like the guy did in his story to him, the kayak guy. Okay, that's that talk. Now that's the third talk. The fourth talk is Elder Paul Piper, who's a 70. He talks about doing the crazy trust exercise in his family, which is, closing your eyes and falling backward and counting on the family member who's standing behind you to catch you. That didn't work out so well in my family. I'm glad it worked out in his. They called it the crazy trust exercise. So he's going to talk about trust. <clears throat> trust is the foundation of all relationships. By the way, when he said this, I had to remark that this is the fact that trust is the foundation of all relationships. I had I still have, it's a different kind of relationship, but I did have a relationship of trust with the church because I was told by them that I could trust them. But this is why I ultimately had to distance myself from that relationship with the LDS church because I found out I could not trust church leaders. They are untrustworthy. They're untrustworthy to tell me the truth about the church. They're untrustworthy in hiding the facts about the church and its history. They're untrustworthy in following the law. See the Securities and Exchange Order finding church leaders 
for breaking the laws of the Security and Exchange Commission and the laws of the federal government of the United States. They got fined for that. They're not trustworthy. They just say they are, <clears throat> which makes them all the more untrustworthy. This is just a talk that's being given here about the plan of salvation. Going back to the pre-mortal existence coming to earth, God trusting us to make our own decisions, though we will often make bad choices, but we can repent, so that's the good news, and get on that path again with that forward momentum toward the temple and toward God. Our relationship with God will grow only to the extent that we put our trust in God. So it's up to us to make that relationship grow by trusting him. He does say that once betrayed, not by God, right? God's not going to betray us. He's talking about a personal relationship. Once a personal relationship is betrayed, we may struggle to trust again, and such bad experiences may impact our willingness to trust God. He talks about two friends who had expressed an interest in the church. One of them had suffered manipulation and control by superiors. That's how he phrases it. He doesn't go into any details. And this affected his ability to express personal feelings to Heavenly Father, but he got over it, yay, and got baptized. Both of them got baptized. He quotes President Nelson, the more we learn about God, the easier it will be to trust him. And the more we learn about the LDS church leaders, the harder it will be to trust them. I added that part. So I think everybody has quoted President Nelson so far in this session. And you know, it did strike me after last night's last episode that all three, I mean, we had six hours of general conference and nobody, nobody made the obvious comment that this was the anniversary of the organization of the church and nobody mentioned it being Jesus's birthday either, even though Elder Bedar got to speak on that day yesterday. And he's the one who likes to talk about that most. Okay. After he finished law school, once again, this is back to Elder Piper. <clears throat> once he finished law school in Utah, he moved his family out to the eastern United States. Now, he did this as a part of prayer and with his family, and he felt God impressed him to move to the eastern United States, obviously to take a job at a big law firm. He felt confirmed in this because initially things went well, but then things went south. There was downsizing at the law firm. He faced the prospect of no job and having no insurance. And right then he has a child born, a daughter with severe uh, physical challenges. So obviously she needs a lot of treatment. Now he's looking at having no insurance. He's looking at this idea of, I followed or I thought I followed God's inspiration and now I've moved and things are not working out. So was that God's inspiration or was it not? Was it me thinking it was God's inspiration? His resolution to this is not to say, well, I was wrong or I must have misinterpreted my feelings to think it was God telling me to go out here. His solution is to double down and to say it doesn't make any difference how bad things get in a situation where you initially think that God had led you there. You just keep trusting in God and you sweat it out and you make it work because this is where God wants you to be. Not only did he have <clears throat> his job that he had to work at, he hadn't lost it. Not only does he have his family, not only does he have his daughter with, born with challenges, he also gets a calling. He's probably made a bishop. He doesn't say what it is. He said he got a call to serve, which required a lot of time and commitment. So I'm guessing it's probably a bishop or something, maybe a state president, maybe a counselor. And he began to question the decision that his family had made and their inspiration. And one day the words came to his mind, don't ask why, ask what I want you to learn. So that's the double down formula. Don't ask why you came out here. Ask yourself what God wants you to learn by having you come out here. Now, when he was struggling with his decision, God is asking him to trust him God even more. So the best way to trust God was by simply trusting him. In subsequent weeks, he says, God unfolded his plan to bless his family. There are absolutely no details. That's kind of, that's where his story ends, as I recall. 
There are no freaking details, except I didn't write freaking down here in my notes. He says, God unfolded his plan to bless his family. Well, what happened? Did you get fired? Did you lose the insurance? Did you have to get another job? Did you have to get two more jobs? What happened to your daughter? You know, all these questions that he has set up as being a really bad situation that they're in because they followed what he thought was God's impression to move to the Eastern United States and take this job. He says, well, I just trusted God and everything worked out. That's all he's saying. God unfolded his plan to bless his family. We need details on this. We need to find out what happened and how it was that God made everything okay. So God is focused on our growth. And he does this apparently by telling us to go into situations that turn out badly. But he tells us we still have to trust him. Over and over again, he does this. This is his pattern according to this talk. And this is supposed to build faith? Or is this a rationale for dealing with situations where you believe you are following a prompting from the Lord and it goes to caca? I've had experience with this. I bet many of you have had. Haven't you had the experience where you felt you were impressed by God to do something, to uh, either take a job, marry a certain person? I mean, this is my second wife that I'm talking about, the whole story of my second wife. Huge, huge revelations, undeniable impressions. I'm supposed to marry this woman. And it weren't. It went just as bad, if not worse, than moving to the East Coast and taking a job with a law firm out there. Years are spent. I spent years. reflecting on this obvious revelation, like a two by four upside the head that I'm supposed to marry this woman. And yet the marriage itself is pretty much from the get go, horrible and not a good fit. And nobody's happy. And in spite of trying the best, right? But I sit in that and I sit in that and I sit in that <clears throat> for years and years and ultimately 22 years. Until finally, I realize that basing big decisions on spiritual impressions, no matter how strong they may seem, is not the best way to run your life. Um, it took me 22 years to really figure that out. And in a similar way, I did the same kind of thing with my membership in the LDS Church. I had huge spiritual experiences with the Book of Mormon when I was 18, when I was 19. And as a result of those, I ended up staying in the church decades after it stopped working for me and decades after it became something that was not a plus in my life, but was a negative in my life. We can do these things. I share this with you because this talk is bringing up this issue to me and giving a different response. What this talk is saying is that no matter how bad that second marriage was, no matter how awful it was and how miserable I was. I needed to stay in that because God had told me to go into it in the first place. And with the church, no matter how miserable I was in the church, no matter how oppressive the atmosphere became when I would go to church, oppressive to my spirit, I should stay in it for the rest of my life because of the spiritual impressions I had when I was a teenager. Yeah, I finally had to wake up much later in life. You know, I'm a slow learner. I'm very stubborn. I want to be obedient to those impressions that I was sure I got from God. And I was for so long that it almost came to the point of life having no meeting and really looking forward to the grave because life was that miserable. Until finally I got to the point where I said, you know, whatever happened back then, that was then, this is now. And I don't have to live the rest of my life based upon the spiritual impression I got when I was much younger and decades ago. Okay, that's getting kind of personal. <clears throat> Let's go on from there, okay? The choir sings Redeemer of Israel. Elder Patrick Kieran gets to talk. This is his first talk as an apostle in general conference. He's introduced by Elder Eyring, um, who reminds us that even though he was only sustained yesterday in general conference, he was ordained as an apostle on December 7th, 2023. So once again, just showing 
We don't need your stinking sustaining vote. We'll ordain whoever we want to be apostles. And you as members and your votes are just an afterthought. It's just a formality. He talks about the plan of salvation. By the way, wonderful accent, very posh, very nice. Patrick Kieran. In fact, the next speaker is going to say, when Patrick sits down and the next speaker stands up, he's going to say, hey, could I borrow your accent for the next 10 minutes? That was a funny line. He'll talk about the wonderful plan of salvation. He'll even call it the fabulous plan of salvation. He says it's designed to bring you all home. No one has built a roadblock. This is his theme. No one has built a roadblock in this plan of salvation. And no one is positioned there to tell you to turn around and leave. He can quote passages from scripture to that effect. But, but, you know what the but is. We'll get to the but. He says, nobody's there to turn you around and send you back. Well, I thought, except for at one time, there was a roadblock about the blacks. That was kind of a roadblock. Maybe not telling you to turn completely back, but, you know, go over there and you can't come into this building because that's where people who can have the priesthood go. And now that the temple and priesthood ban on blacks was lifted in 1978, now they have the same issue, but with a different community, the LGBTQ community. And it is obvious, to me at least, that members of that community, there is a roadblock in the LDS church telling them that you can't come in, or at least you can't come as you are. You know, you got to come in as something you're not. It's going to be, um, what is it, a costume party? Yeah, you have to dress and act as something you're not in order to come into the church if you belong to that community. Otherwise, it's definitely a roadblock, and a person is stationed there to tell you to leave and go home. Obviously, this is what he's addressing. At least it's obvious to me. Um but can we just say what we mean? Is it possible, Elder Kieran, for you to just say what you mean instead of arguing by metaphor, which can be interpreted as something else and anything else? You're not really communicating your message unless it's to people who want to interpret it the way you mean it, but they can also interpret it in some other way. The plan of happiness he says, is to cause you happiness. He talks about the intent of God. The intent of God and the plan of happiness is that you be happy. The intent of God and the plan of salvation is that you have salvation. But when he says the plan of happiness is to cause you happiness, I kind of hear it as saying another way of saying that true happiness is found only in Mormonism, right? If the, pl if the plan of happiness is intended to cause you happiness, well, then you've got to be in Mormonism to have that happiness. And only by those who follow that plan of happiness as laid out in Mormonism. So not just being a member, but a faithful member who does everything you're supposed to. Th those are the people who have happiness. That's why it's the plan of happiness, right? No happiness outside the church. Not real happiness anyway. Just that fake happiness. Or as we would say in Japan, Ichiji teku, ichiji teku na manzoku shika mitasanai mono desu. That was a hard thing to memorize even back then. Ichiji teku na menzoku shika mitasanai mono desu. And I think that was a temporary and fleeting happinesses that are or fleeting things that don't give lasting happiness. That's what it was. That's what we taught the, the Japanese back in 1980 and 81. So Elder Kieran keeps saying that God's plan is not to keep us out, but now he segues into how we have to keep the commandments in order to allow God to do with us what he wants to do with us all along. I'm going to say that again, because I think that's important, and I think I wrote it out correctly. He keeps saying God's plan is not to keep us out. But now Elder Kieran, in his talk, segues into how we have to keep the commandments in order to allow God to do with us, i.e. make us happy, in order to allow God to do with us what he wants to do with us all along. Again, we're encountering the same theme that God is bound by Mormonism as much as the members are bound by Mormonism and its laws and its commandments. God is bound by it as much as the members. It's almost like Amos 3.7 should be rewritten to say, For surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he runneth his will by the Mormon prophets for approval. So he talks about all the marginalized people most of them in the New Testament, 
that encountered Jesus, and Jesus did not reject them. He did not turn them away. <clears throat> he did not put up a roadblock. He says he did not reject the woman with the issue of blood or the leper, and he gives a bunch of other examples, and he says, and he will not reject you. He says he does not put up roadblocks and barriers. He does not keep you out. He welcomes you in. Yes, Elder Kiron, that is the Jesus of the New Testament. But the Jesus of the Mormon church acts very differently. The Jesus of the Mormon church will not welcome you in if you are L, if you are G, if you are B, if you are T, or if you are Q. There's a roadblock for the Mormon Jesus, for all those people. The Jesus of the New Testament was different than the Jesus of the Mormon church. And I think you kind of just really made that point very well in your talk. So is Elder Kieran speaking of how he thinks the church should act? This is ultimately, I, these are my last thoughts on his talk, because my impression from reading about him and hearing about him was that there was some hope that this would be a more enlightened apostle, one who would be more Christ-like, one who would reach out to people who are marginalized. And I don't know what to make of his talk. Is he speaking of how he thinks the church should act in hopes it will ultimately come around to his vision as he um, graduates up in the levels of seniority in the apostles? Is that what he's doing? Is he speaking of how he hopes the church will act and should act? Or is he giving cover for the church, pretending it is welcoming and unjudgmental like Jesus in the New Testament when actually it is anything but? So ultimately, I have to say, no, Elder Kieran, the LDS church is the roadblock. And it does tell people to turn around and go home. Certain people, the people who don't fit in the Mormon paradigm. Okay. So I liked your talk, love your accent. I'm not buying your message or the proposition on which it's based. I do hope that you will continue to live long and prosper and that these ideas will become part of the Mormon church and we will see more inclusion and more welcoming and fewer roadblocks in the future because of you. All right. Number six, we're getting close to the end. What is our time like? Shouldn't even look. 47 minutes. Okay. Let me uh, start moving quicker. Elder Brian Taylor, he, he's the one who asked if he could borrow Kieran's accent for 10 minutes. He tells three New Testament stories. Elder Brian Taylor of the seven. He tells three New Testament stories about people who get their miracle immediately, one who gets their miracle a little bit later, and one who doesn't get the miracle at all till after they die. Yes, we get another talk on this subject of why is it that miracles don't happen in our lives. That's really what it's all about. He wants to give an example of a person who got their miracle immediately to show that it's still like possible. Another person has to wait and another person doesn't get it at all. So this is another talk and another apologetic. And we've already heard them before in this very conference about why it is we're not having these miracles happen in our life all except for the, the first talker last night who had who was raising people from the dead. That was amazing. All our trials give us the education we came here to acquire to make us more like God. All right, this is a common trope and a common defense as to why it is that God doesn't help us out when we're going through bad times. Even though he can see us, he loves us, and he has the power to do it, he's just not going to help out. Once again, I want to say something I said yesterday, which is interesting. Because if I saw someone who was in trouble, and if I cared about them, and if I had the power to help them, I'd help them, but not God. So that's just one of the many ways in which Radio Free Mormon is different from God. This is another apologetic, and it's, a very, it's an apologetic that's been used in many, many churches for thousands of years in order to defend God for his inaction and his invisibility, and his seeming indifference. Well, he really isn't indifferent. He really isn't, you know, invisible. He really isn't uncaring. It's just that we need to go to, through this for our own good, right? It's for our good. Life's trials prove us. Even the Savior was made perfect through suffering. 
by the way, there is some truth in that. Certainly, uh, as the, what is it? The Arabian proverb has it, the growing soul is watered best by tears of sadness, that kind of thing. Sure, there's some truth to that. There's a lot of truth to that. But then again, there's a whole other ballpark of experiences where people are abused horribly, physically, sexually, tortured, even to death, where you say, what the hell was the purpose of that? And how does that make them a better person? And how do they learn from those trials, especially when they're killed in the process? So that's the whole ball ballpark of other examples that don't seem to submit themselves to this particular apologetic that trials are there for our own good. We rarely hear about those because it doesn't fit the pattern and it's not so easily answered and he's not going to talk about it here, Brian Taylor. Um, he says, life's trials prove us, even the savior was made perfect through suffering and what I'm hearing is an, again another apologetic for why it is priesthood power <clears throat> does not seem to work in this church. Believe it or not, he quotes President Nelson. And then he talks about this experience. And I'm not sure who Holly and Rick Porter are. They may be members of his stake or ward some years ago. I think there was some kind of meeting. But there's this horrible story that he tells. And he tells it so quickly, um, it almost passed me by as I was trying to take down the notes. Of this young man, I'm not sure how old he was. He could have been a boy. who. I think he's at home. There's a fire. He get he burns to death. His mother is there, and her mother tries to save him, but she can't. But she gets her hands all burned in the process of trying to save him. This is how I heard the story. So Holly and Rick Porter are the parents. Holly's the mother with burned hands. Trey is the son who passed away in a fire at the home. This is my understanding of the story. And that there's some kind of meeting, sacrament meeting at church where Holly is talking about it to the congregation. And she's talking about her burned hands and that she had burned her hands trying to save her son, Trey, from the fire, but failing to do so. So the reason he brings this up is because Holly is talking in terms of miracles and um, peace and all sorts of things that she's received from God in spite of this horrible accident. Of course, the miracle is metaphorical. It's a metaphorical miracle. It's not a real miracle. The fire was not extinguished miraculously. The son was not saved miraculously. She wasn't even permitted by God to save her own son, but had her fingers burned in the process. So this seems like an extreme attempt to take a really, really horrible situation and somehow find a way to put God in it and find God in it, and find a miracle in it somehow, though I'm not sure I see a lot of miracles in this particular story. He says, as you think celestial, you will see things in a new light. Yep, think celestial, it's getting play. That's good. Be oh, <clears throat> that's what he says. As you think celestial, you will see these things in a new light, like the story about Trey and Holly and Rick Porter. And I thought, that's good. That's good. We'll see things in a new light because otherwise I might think that God doesn't care about these people. So now think celestial is an excuse for no miracles in the church. Yes. It's multi-purpose. Think celestial is now an excuse, at least in this talk for no miracles in the church. And he wants to say three things, have faith in Jesus Christ and in his atonement. Once again, he quotes president Nelson on the subject. Really, really president Nelson doesn't say anything worth quoting. He is being quoted because of who he is, not because of what he says. I'm going to quote President Nelson for some other banal proposition. Brighter hope, this is number two, brighter hope comes by envisioning our eternal destiny. <clears throat> brighter hope comes by envisioning our eternal destiny, which sounds a lot like being celestial. I don't know why we have the trials we have, but I think that the rewards we get will be so outstanding in the next life we will say to God, is that all I had to do to get these incredible blessings? Excuse me. That's what he's saying. Yes, he does get around to saying think celestial. And that was even what God was telling Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail was think celestial or the equivalent of it. Number three, greater power comes from focusing on joy. During Jesus's worst hours on the cross, 
He did it because he focused on his coming joy. So he even knows how Jesus was able to hang in there on the cross so long. He did it by focusing on his coming joy. We will suffer no afflictions that will not be consumed, devoured in Christ. And he talks to those whose bitter cups have not been removed. <clears throat> the reason he's doing this again is to tell us that even though we have bitter cups and crosses to bear that have not been removed by God, Jesus was on the cross and he persevered in his atonement and in the agony by thinking about how great it was going to be after he died. That's really what he's saying, the coming glory. And that's what he is encouraging us to do is to hang in there in spite of how bad things get because God loves us. And just think about that coming glory because when we die and we get all that glory from enduring our pains and agonies and the injustices that have been uh, allowed by God to come upon us, then we'll turn back and we'll look, wow, that was all I had to go through to get these incredible blessings. That was nothing. Once again, we are faced with a strange side of a church that believes and teaches divine intervention, miracles, prayer, and priesthood blessings on the one hand, but on the other hand, multiples, oh, but on the other hand, multiplies talks like this. Every general conference giving excuses and apologetics as to why God does not intervene, why the miracle doesn't come, why the prayer is not answered, and why the priesthood blessings do not work. You know, it occurred to me, it's like some kind of crazy uncle who gives you the same gift every birthday, but puts it in a different wrapping paper, thinking you won't notice. That's what so many of these talks are like. Like um, Elder uh, Renland, he gives the same talk every time. He wraps it up differently by a different story. This time it's about kayaks. Another time it was about delivery systems. I remember that one. He wraps the story up every differently every time, but it's the same present. And it's like he thinks we're not going to notice that he's given the same talk because he's wrapped it with different uh, wrapping paper. Now we return, or he returns, to the sacrament meeting where Holly Porter was speaking about their burned-to-death son, Trey. And while he's there, so I'm, I'm guessing he's uh, the bishop or the state president at the time in the sacrament meeting, he says he felt he needed to help by quoting Jesus's words, which he quoted then, and I'll quote the same words today to close out his talk. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Okay. The choir sings, his eye is on the sparrow. I don't remember hearing this before. It reminded me of the theme song from Beretta, though. Do you remember that one? Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Keep your eye on the sparrow. Yeah, church leaders should have thought about that before they started goofing around with the SEC. Yep, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. We'll see if any jail time's coming. Could happen. Last speaker, drum roll please, President Dallin H. Oaks will address us. Now, can I just give you the boil down of his talk? He starts by saying, how is your church different from others? That he's been asked this all his life. And his answer has changed over his life. He says he was born in 1932. Talks about how small the membership was and how few temples they had. So now as of April 1st of this year, he says we have 189 dedicated temples and 146 more in planning and construction. So yeah, the church is so much bigger today. He's going to speak about the temples and the role of covenants. And the eyes roll back up in the head. And we're going to have another talk about covenants. How much can you say about covenants, really? Well, he's going to say it again. A covenant is a commitment to fulfill certain responsibilities. A vocal minority currently oppose or opposes institutional authority and believe people should be free of any restrictions that limit their individual freedom. Okay. Yet we know that individuals relinquish individual freedoms to live in society. So he's talking about uh, the fact that in order to live in society, yes, individuals have to relinquish certain individual freedoms in order to live in society. Yeah, that makes sense. But 
he could take that a different direction, but he doesn't really seem to. You know, this is part of um, this is the the speaker, the general authority. He's usually most famous for speaking about religious freedom, which, when you take it to its conclusion, ends up being the freedom to um, the freedom to discriminate against other groups of people with which your religious freedom doesn't agree, right? So it's the religious freedom to discriminate against others is usually what it is. But that's not what he's doing today, at least it seems not. Um, he gives examples of covenant responsibility. See, this is what he's talking about, covenants, and talking about different people in society who make covenants. And he's using it kind of loosely, but he says people like judges, of course, he used to be a judge, right? military personnel, medical personnel, and firefighters. He says, all of these people make a commitment, that's the covenant, to perform their assigned duty. So when we need them, they're there. Okay. And then he adds, the same is true of full-time missionaries. He has to add that. I don't know why. Now, then he talks about the uniforms of these different people, the judges, the military, medical, firefighters. He says, uniforms signify the covenants they have made. And then he says, interestingly, because we know where he's going with the the, um, uh, the uniforms, he's going to end up talking about uh, temple robes and even garments. And yeah, he's going to talk about garments too. But we know where he's going, or at least I know where he's going. But then he says, uniforms signify the covenants they have made. And he says, there is no magic in their distinctive clothing. Why does he say that? There is no magic in their distinctive clothing. Why would anybody think that? Nobody would think there was any magic in their distinctive clothing, but people might think there's magic in the temple garment, which he's going to end up talking about. So this is his early salvo, which he's not going to repeat later because people might understand exactly what it is he's saying. I don't know. Does, does Elder Oak speak to be understood or to not be understood? Because a lot of times I have to ferret out his meaning like this in such a way that I can't imagine that most people would give the time and attention and energy necessary to parse his talk to the point, to understand his meaning. Um, and so they're not going to get it. But he says, there's no magic in their distinctive clothing. And I said, are you saying this about garments now? That was my immediate comment when he said that. And yes, it is. He says, the same is true of engagement and wedding rings, that they are things we wear, sends a message to others. Okay. Covenant found covenants are the foundation for the regulation of individual lives. Now he segues into religious covenants, talks about the Abrahamic covenant, fundamental to several great religious traditions, introduces God's covenant promises with his children. The first heart, part of the Book of Mormon, the first part of the Book of Mormon. <laughs> there would probably be Isabel. The first part of the Book of Mormon has covenants in it too. Nephi told the Old Testament or excuse me, Nephi said the Old Testament was a record of the Jews which contained the covenants of the Lord which he hath made unto the house of Israel. And then he lists a bunch of guys in the Book of Mormon who made covenants. Now he switches to Joseph Smith and the Restoration. He's covered the Bible. Now he went to the Book of Mormon. Now he's going to go to Joseph Smith and church history all about covenants. His whole goal is to say it's covenants all the way down. Moroni mentions the promises made to the fathers must be fulfilled. Also, many teachings about covenants in the Book of Mormon that Joseph Smith was translating. The Book of Mormon is the foundation of the Restoration and is filled with references to covenants. Ah, okay, we get it. There's covenants everywhere. And you went and did your Google search for covenants in the scriptures, and now you're sharing them with us. Um, I do have to note something about this thing he said here, that the Book of Mormon is the foundation of the Restoration. He says this in order to talk about all the mentions of covenants in it. I want to note that the Book of Mormon is the foundation of the restoration of the LDS Church, even as Elder Oak said. And yet, even though it talks a lot about covenants in it, I have to note the Book of Mormon says nothing about LGBTQ people having to act straight in order to be accepted by Jesus Christ. That's not in the foundational scripture of the LDS Church. Maybe there's a reason for that, Elder Oaks. And I would encourage you to ponder upon that. Elder Oaks does the same word hopping on Doctrine and... Oh, this was rather interesting. Remember yesterday where there was a speaker who came to Doctrine and Covenant, section 20, verse 37, 
the one that talks about the requirements for baptism into the church, it has the curious part in it that says that you have to show that you have received a remission of your sins by the Spirit before you get baptized. Not that you receive a remission of your sins by getting baptized, but you have to show that you have received a remission of your sins in order to get baptized. Remember that one? And how that speaker didn't simply read the passage, but he picked out the different parts in it that still comport with modern Mormonism, leaving out that part that does not. Elder Oaks does the exact same thing with the exact same verse. Doctrine and Covenants 20, 37, the word hopping that was done yesterday within that verse. Um, and which makes me wonder, why even have a verse in our scriptures? And this is this is not a random verse. This is an important verse. It's the Articles and Covenants of the Church. It's section 20. It tells how the church is supposed to operate, right? And it talks about one verse, the requirements of that have to be met before a person is baptized into the church. And one of them is that they've received a remission of their sins. Why even have a verse in our scriptures that we can't just read but have to hop around in in order to make it not contradict modern Mormon doctrine? It's kind of an astonishing situation and really highlighted by the fact that not one but two people in general conference have done it so far. Okay. He works in the covenant path because he's talking about covenants from President Nelson and also think celestial. He gets both of those in there. And then he segues into temple covenants. You're killing me, Smalls. I get it. There's covenants in the Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Mormon, church history, and in the temple. Boom. I got it. But now he's going to keep going on about that. And he says those who are faithful to those covenants in the temple are promised eternal life. And at this point, I'm thinking with this laborious prelude about covenants, covenants everywhere, I am sure hoping there is a point to this at the end of this talk because this is a heck of a buildup and the buildup itself is mind-numbingly boring. And then he goes to the garments. This appears to be what the whole buildup is for. And interestingly, he's going to give the same message about garments as Sister Dennis gave yesterday. So not just one person are talking about the garments in general conference, which is kind of a first as far as I can remember. Two of them are going to, one to the women and one who is a man, not just a man, a superman. He is the first counselor in the first presidency. Persons endowed in the temple, he says, are responsible to wear the temple garment. Damn it. He is going to hit it too, not just Sister Dennis. We are instructed, he said, to wear the temple garments continuously. I don't think he says night and day. I think he uses the word continuously, same meaning. Because temple garments do not take a day off, removing the garments can't, oh, wait, wait. I think it's because temple covenants, because temple covenants, he said, do not take a day off. Removing the garments can be taken as a disclaimer of the covenants to which they relate. Yes, he actually said that. That's how he said that. He's, he's a lawyer through and through. He said, because Temple covenants do not take a day off. Removing the garments can be taken by whom? God, I don't know. Removing the garments can be taken as a disclaimer of the covenants to which they relate. So you take them off and you're disclaiming the covenants as long as you have them off and you're reclaiming the covenants when you put them on. Yes, he actually said this. What a freaking lawyer. I'm a lawyer. I was a lawyer practicing 34 years and this kind of stuff just drives me insane in a spiritual context. This is why law and religion are like oil and water. They don't mix. They shouldn't mix. And when they come together, it's like the blob in that old Steve McQueen movie. The law is the blob, and it takes over the old guy with the stick and totally eats him up. And that's what's happened in the LDS church. The old guy with the stick at the beginning of the movie, I think he was the first victim of the blob. Anyway, this is what lawyers do to the things of God. They drain the spirit completely out of it so that the Holy Ghost is in the hospital, it's on life support, in the emergency room, and then they draw, then they come into the emergency room, they put the Holy Ghost there, and then they come in and draw up the last will and testament for the Holy Ghost so that when it dies, we have that will to continue after. We don't have the Holy Ghost anymore, but we got the law, and that's the important thing. 
from the point of view of a lawyer. That's all we have left going at this point in the Mormon church. Not the Holy Ghost, but the last will and testament of the Holy Ghost that was drawn up by Mormon lawyers after they bled the Holy Ghost dead long ago. So, that's it. And when I said, that's it, he's coming to the conclusion of his talk. And I went, wait, that's it? That was the whole point that you were driving toward with your incessant talk of covenants, President Oaks? That's what all the talk of covenants was leading up to? Wear your garments? Wow, they must really be having a problem with this. Mormons not wearing their garments. It's like, if the Mormons would just wear their temple garments all the time, society would be so much better. The world would be such a better place, and people would be so much more righteous if they just wore their garments under their clothing all the time and didn't take them off periodically. So we can lift ourselves and our countries by paying tithing to the church, and we can make our lives better and our societies better by wearing continuously the underwear that the church prescribes us to wear. The choir closes with, Lord, I would follow thee, and the closing prayer was given by a 70 of some sort. Well, that's about it. Wow, I'm at one hour and 11 minutes. I think I went long because I got personal there for a bit. I hope I didn't annoy you with that. It seemed like something that I felt prompted to say from what source I could not tell. But I shared it with you. I hope you enjoyed it. We are going to sign off now. And by we, I mean, I'm going to sign off now because I'm the only one here. I appreciate your watching. Thank you so much. And we will join again at the end of the last session. Yes. Thank goodness. Does anybody else just like dread general conference and have to go through it? Like you're, I don't know, like rowing a, a kayak and getting knocked over by waves all the time. And you have to struggle and get up on them and they're, you're just exhausted by it. That's how I feel when I have to watch general conference. I don't know about anybody else. It is the least spiritually fulfilling thing in my life is watching general conference. And the same thing was true from 1978, even when I was an active Mormon. I didn't say that to other people. I told them, wow, I'm spiritually fed. Wow, what wonderful prophets, seers, and revelators. And so that makes me wonder sometimes when other people tell me, wow, I'm spiritually fed. What wonderful prophets, seers, and revelators. Are they thinking inside the same things that I thought inside when I would spew those same words? I don't know. Let's go ahead. Let's close. It's an hour and 12 minutes into the show. Thanks again, everybody. I'm going to click end on this live stream, and I'll see you again in approximately three hours for the final episode about General Conference for April of 2024. Thanks for joining me.